Well, hello, my friends. Welcome. Very happy to be here with you today because I have with me Ines Wen. She's joining us all the way from London along with artist Gordon Chung, and it's going to be a great conversation. We're going to talk about the convergence of art and technology. Resources, inspiring interviews, business practices, and practical advice to take your art career to the next level. Join Sergio Gomez in today's Artist Next Level and get ready to take control of your career. Well, my friends, welcome back. It's always excited to be here with you once again. And uh, something that I love is that we are now able to connect with so many people, so many artists, creators, and people in the art world from around the world. And today is no exception I have with me Ines Wen, who is she's an international art business consultant and curator. She's also the director of the non for profit uh, organization, International Chinese Fine Arts Council in Chicago. She's uh, in London right now. We know each other here from the Chicago connection. We actually met in Arbaso, but we both ended up being connected here with Chicago too. So we have uh, run into each other in many uh, places and many events as well. And uh, we have also been in touch, you know, for quite a while. So we started talking about technology, you know, for the last uh, few um, weeks and uh, texting back and forth. And that's kind of like this whole thing started. So Ines introduced me to artist Gordon Chung. Uh, Gordon is a London-based artist. He has developed an innovative approach to painting, which blurs the line between virtual and actual realities. We're going to talk about what that means. And, uh, you know, he has a huge and long extensive resume, which you can find on his website. And uh, but out of, uh, you know, the highlights, he has been in many exhibitions, uh, many museums around the world. And uh, his work, for example, is in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And I think everybody has heard about that museum, right? <laughs> so a very, a very extensive experience. And I'm super happy to have you both here in the show today. How are you? Good. We're good. Thank you for having us. Yeah, and uh, looking forward to uh, our chat. Absolutely not. Thank you for being here. You know, it's always fun to connect uh, here through the internet. And I know we have uh, different time zones and things. So for me here, breakfast with Sergio uh, episode. So it's kind of an, an early chat, but for you guys, it's already, uh, breakfast is already all gone. You already had probably <laughs> lunch and dinner and you had a uh, good in the evening. So uh, this is a really fun and also interesting uh, kind of conversation we're going to have because technology is something that, you know, uh, has been kind of like the tool that has helped us all stay connected throughout this pandemic. You know, I was thinking the other day, what would have happened if we didn't have the internet, right? If we didn't have social media, if we didn't have all these tools that we have. Well, first of all, probably we had not heard about the pandemic because it has, it, you know, as it spread out throughout the world, it would have taken very long for people to realize uh, and then to communicate and then to also help each other stay connected. And uh, what an amazing tool, right? What an amazing, um, you know, thing that, that has been created and it has been evolving. But at the same time, you know, as it also uh, now has been a lot more in the news because of the NFTs and how, you know, art and technology continue to converge and talking to so many artists every day uh, here through, you know, the things that we do in social media and so on, you know, realizing that sometimes it's becoming like, what, you know, what is an NFT? What is blockchain? You know, how does that, you know, and you see all these news and, you know, the New York Times had, um, huge article on NFTs, Time Magazine, like four or five pages on NFTs, you know, just a couple of weeks ago. So, you know, it could feel overwhelming. So today we have, uh, you know, both of you here uh, because you also have some experience on, on these two. And uh, uh, I think, uh, you know, you can give us uh, some light, Gordon, particularly with your own art practice. So maybe start there. Um, you know, I don't want to take all the, all the talking myself. So Gordon, tell us a little bit about you know, first of all, your kind of your interest uh, for technology and, you know, in your art practice, you're talking about uh, this process, which I've been following on your social media and also on your website, beautiful documentation of that, of uh, the blurring the line between virtual and actual reality. So tell us about how does that look like uh, in your own art practice first? Sure. Um, so my interest in technology came about from the last century when uh, I was at art school from 94 to 98 at St. Martin's. And uh, back then there was a lot of focus on, you know, the uh, abstract painting and the purity of it and so on. And, and I really wanted to make something about the world 
because uh, there were all these revolutions I felt that were happening, particularly in technology. And that would be the rise of the internet and available phone, uh, uh, mobile phone technology. So uh, I came from an age <laughs> in which, you know, mobile phones didn't exist, right. uh, let alone yeah, smart. Right, right. <laughs> so, um, so for me, uh, I recognize this as a revolutionary moment, you know, in which uh, I wanted to capture within painting itself. And so what way could I do that, but adopt or adapt with technology into the painting uh, itself? And so started to produce uh, this idea of painting without paint to challenge myself to find substitutes. And what it led me to do was to use uh, ultimately things like maps and stock listings of the Financial Times uh, to as a metaphor of uh, these spaces, these spaces that are like totally globally interconnected and um, creating this new landscape, this new world in which we all occupy, where this flow of information, trillions of capital in an instant moving, carving and accumulating, and in those places creating utopias or dystopias. And so to try and find these kind of, in a way, modern mythological spaces and capture that within the language of painting and to from there build you know, a, a more complex language to deal with uh, other things leading up to, I suppose, I'm, I'm now going through about 21 years of uh, work and uh, to what my current work is uh, looking and focused about, which is uh, blockchain technology and uh, the new revolution, the new technological revolution of what this will enable, this decentralized network, you know, of, um, of a possible alternative monetary system in reaction to the Occupy uh, movement from the 2008 financial crisis in which the economic failure by our leaders had led us into this global economic collapse through which uh, uh, these groups of people sought for an alternative form that now in 2021 we are now f seeing institutions including banks you know just almost panic buying you know into this space and, uh, and so NFT is an example of um, what is perhaps a bubble right now, but it's an alternative or a new type of platform through which uh, artists can, you know, uh, occupy and take control of uh, their market or ability to enter the market in a new way. Um, so lots of lots of complex conversations there to be yeah. had. We will unpack a little bit of, of some of those yeah. things, but uh, before we get there, you know, something that I really appreciate about your work too, because as a painter myself, you know, as you talk about technology and the convergence of that and how it's changing the world, you know, your love for painting and, you know, the act of painting as a medium as well, which you is very obvious in your work. Uh, it's not like you left painting to go, you know, digital or, but you know, there's, there's also that tangible, uh, aspect of the history of painting in what you do. Tell me a little bit about that because I'm super interested, uh, you know, how your brain works with both, you know, the, the ancient medium of painting as a process, right, in, in the historical component of that, and then, you know, these technological ideas and, and as the world changes, you know. So I when I... Uh, uh, painting pretty much. Uh -huh. So when I, when I was uh, thinking about painting without paint, the way that I did that would be to substitute uh, pigment for information. Information being like in you know, the maps or um, uh, uh, the stock listings of the Financial Times uh, and the way that I would uh, uh, cut them up almost as if I was grinding my own paint. Okay. And then technology was the, was the brush. So for example, a photocopying machine. So I'd often create these collages and then on the photocopying machine, as it was scanning, I'd move it around. And by moving it around, you're kind of smearing the image. Mm -hmm. And then you cut those shapes out because they look like brush strokes. And then you kind of like collage them back down into, into the, the paintings. So when you're looking at them, it looks like a painting, but there's no paint in them. So what I'm asking is like, well, what is it that makes a painting? You know, is uh, you're asking the philosophical questions of like what, what it means to make a painting as well. And then because it involves technology, and uh, the stuff of like this invisible space that we all occupy, this information space, uh, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, it, by 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 those uh, by that meaning is about uh, those uh, those landscapes as well, and and the processes and the techniques and so on, and uh, to talk about uh, these new spaces that we're all uh, occupying. And I feel that painting is a way of uh, you know uh, it's it's a it's a language it's a language in order to say something about our humanity, about our world, about our landscape, how we occupy it. And so to question, in a way, the authenticity, if you like, of the brushstroke as well, in, through these mechanical reproductions, uh, through these techniques and processes, was a question that I always wanted to ask. And that may well be because I, it, my identity itself is rooted in the in-between. You know, I, I'm born in, in London. I'm born in the UK. My parents are immigrants from Hong Kong. Mm-hmm. Hong Kong used to be a colony of the British Empire. And so there's all these things that at the time I didn't understand, but but that was my identity, this in-between state. And so painting itself embodied, you know, or the medium itself through which I was like conveying what was in my heart and soul, you know, through reflection on the world uh, uh, in a wider sense right. was a way of expressing those sorts of uh, internal rooted conditions as well as the history and bearing witness to it. And I love that. Thank you for explaining that. I think that that makes total sense. And, and then it gives us a, a wider view of the world that you're producing. So let me bring uh, Ines here in the conversation too. So Ines, uh, tell me about also your interest in technology and also, of course, you know, how did you get involved uh, with working with Gordon and the things that he was doing, the projects that he was, uh, you know, part of and, um, you know, pretty much your own interest on, on this whole technological uh, aspects of the art world. Well, Gordon and I come from very different perspectives on technology. <clears throat> I grew up in technology. Mm-hmm. My parents are both engineers. Okay. My mom is a computer scientist and my, my father has his PhD in, in civil engineering, but they both worked at Bell Labs. And mm-hmm. I've had a computer in my in my bedroom since I was uh, eight years old. <laughs> oh, wow, okay. So to me, technology was just, was like a, a third arm kind of, uh, yeah. you know, it, was, it was just always there. And I never really questioned it. Actually, when I first went to college mm-hmm. and started to explore my identity, I yeah. rejected technology. <laughs> I wanted to do everything by hand. I wanted to write people letters on paper. Uh-huh. You know, I, I, I did everything non-technology based until I entered the work world. world. I moved to New York after college and um, uh, after U of I actually. And then I'm moved to New York and I realized that was a, that's what was going to pay the bills was knowing this technology. So I used everything I already knew, uh, you know, computer skills, Photoshop, you know, all of that stuff. And that's how I started working with artists, you know, because a lot of artists didn't, they weren't taught these tools in school. I came from design school. So I knew how to do presentations and I knew how to organize. I knew how to plan a project, you know, whereas like they didn't teach you guys that in art school. I don't know why, but it's a very important part of getting projects, writing grants and, right. you know, ma- managing your business because every artist is a small business owner. Exactly. No, so, so, right. so, so how did you start working uh, with Gordon in the in the projects that he was working on? How did you get interested on on that? Well, when Gordon and I met, Gordon, well, I, I was I'm an art consultant and Gordon is an artist. So we started talking about different ways that I could contribute to uh, his career. And one of the things that he came up with was um, he somehow got all of his artwork stolen uh, uh, by by a gallery museum or something like that in China. Uh, basically, basically stolen or images? Well, he he did, did a show there about 10 years ago and um, and, um, and and couldn't get his work back and didn't oh, get wow. paid for it. You, you know, it's a common story, right? Yeah. We hear about yeah, it all absolutely. the time. We all have heard, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's ridiculous, right? And, and some I names said, in Chicago. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I won, uh, but, yeah. And, and then I said, you know what? I think I can help you, mm-hmm. you know, because I, I have some friends in China who have, you know, big, powerful legal people there. And, 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 then, and then I did. I hired we. I suggested, I recommended a lawyer to Gordon, Gordon hired him, and then, you know, and then on and on and on and on, and then led to, um, anyway, we can't really talk about it actually, because I think that's what the contract says. So no details, but um, anyway, it led to this whole campaign on protect your art. 
Yeah. There's actually uh, there was a there was a big uh, media campaign. Uh, so it, scroll back on Instagram. So it is it is it is easy to actually find the stories there. Although we're not meant to. Although they actually violated the agreement. <laughs> but well, uh, we, we don't uh, like to stoop to yeah. where other people are. So uh, anyway, so we started a whole save your uh, um, protect your art campaign, and a lot of artists jumped on board to support Gordon mm -hmm. in this whole process. It was really kind of heartfelt. Mm. It's that, a it, it's a scary thing to to think about doing, you know. But with Inez's, uh, uh, you know, expertise and uh, connections and understanding of how to retrieve the work, uh, it, it felt uh, safe to do because, of course, a lot of artists would be afraid to actually make them seem like as though they're troublemakers. It's a very strange sort of uh, mentality because, of course, you're the victim, right. you know, in this scenario. So. To, so to think that you would get lawyers, you know, and to fight to get your work back, mm -hmm. you know, and that you would be afraid of doing that mm -hmm. um, because you're afraid of how other galleries might see you as a troublemaker exactly. is kind of exactly. a very, very absurd uh, situation. Mm -hmm. But the community, the arts community and the online community were so supportive. Technology yeah and um yeah it was you know the, the it was them that were actually responding and and essentially shaming them into into uh, seeing that uh, their way uh, has repercussions and um and that felt really important you know if at the very least my actions could have prevented them from thinking that it would be very easy to do the same thing again to another artist right. and make them suffer you know as right. much as they did for 10 years with holding and stealing two years worth of my work right. is uh it was just an injustice that i couldn't uh, stomach anymore and inez you know stepped up to to help me when uh, I unloaded uh, all of this, you know, the first time that we met, you know, in China, one of our main conversations, was, oh, my God, you know, I've had my work stolen from blah, 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 you know, it's just like, and she took it all on and like, go, that's really bad, Gordon, let me help you, you know, and, uh, and I was like, I never, in a way, I didn't expect to have been uh, uh, victorious, but uh, uh, very much down to uh, Inez here that, uh really help secure and get my work back so then it can now be shown in uh, LA during this summer uh, for my that's, solo exhibition. That's exciting. And, uh, you know, I, I think, yeah, those are common stories that one hears that happen, they still happen. And something I think that technology has brought about because of all this is uh, also a sense of more transparency, you know, mm. and I think technology does for maybe that's a good point right now to jump into uh, smart stamp art, right, which is a way in which uh, it can uh, register maybe you can explain a bit register the work of art and its provenance and where you how it moves in the world because today as if you're an artist your art moves in the world right the moment it leaves your studio it moves in the world and um keeping track of where is it who has it ownership as it exchanges hands over time um i think it's so important for the artists of today so tell me a little bit about this uh smart stamp art technology ines or uh, gordon whoever well, well, as as we were going through this uh, uh, court case, uh, one thing that became very evident is that Gordon's archive, he, Gordon has tons and tons of art artists, artwork uh, throughout his career that needed an archive. And so that and it needed to be digital. It couldn't be on little pieces of paper, you know, stuck right. under notebooks and things like that. So we went on this uh, immense uh, archiving project and loaded everything up into a database and then and then um and then Ju julie from smart Stamp called us and said oh we've i've been following your case online you know um this is something that we're very interested in because we want to help artists mm -hmm. and i said well, what is it what is it and she said oh i started this company called smart stamp and what they do is they take a uh, digital fingerprints of your of your actual artwork and they do this by, I'm actually not totally 100% sure of the technology, but it's, it's, it can be done with a smartphone mm -hmm. where you take a photo and it scans, I think, a 3D image of, of that particular part of the painting and it stores it within a blockchain. Yeah, it is. So, so you're, you're basically uh, like recording, uh, a, like say the back of the canvas. Mm -hmm. uh, so then it's it will be impossible to forge 
you know, you couldn't forge that to the exact, you know, uh, right. reality of what you recorded. And then that is, um, you know, time stamped and, uh, uh, and recorded on this uh, decentralized network of computers, which is basically a decentralized uh, ledger system, mm -hmm. you know, that uh, is impossible to, um, uh, to forge, you know, unless you've got unlimited money to be able to access every computer uh, that uh, that this information is stored on. And so it's like the ultimate, you know, certificate of authenticity. You know, it's, uh, there's no denying that, you know, the information that is uh, stored, you know, on, on, on that sort of network. And, uh, and of course, that has a huge, um, huge uh, implications, you know, in terms of uh, all of the fakes that are out there, but also helping with potentially legal cases. You know, um, you know, in the future, you know, about, um, you know, where your work is and who has it in a given moment and so on. So mm -hmm. I think it's great. I think it's uh, incredibly empowering. Right. And I think, you know, uh, as you mentioned, you know, the, the blockchain being like the decentralized where, you know, it's impossible to, you know, just take it from one spot because it's in multiple, you know, let's say boxes, right, or, or places yeah. within that blockchain. and as it travels and as it moves and as as uh, the outer world like, again the outer world moves in the world you know in that i think right now in this world everything lives a digital footprint right mm. even ourselves as we move around you know this thing is tracking where we're moving right yeah so you know when i go from here to the gallery in a little bit you know i'm leaving a footprint digital footprint of, of my of my movement in this earth and the things that i do the things that i say alexa what is this alexa what is that you know that's all the digital footprint that we are all leaving behind. And I think it's so important again for the art to uh, also have that digital footprint as it moves in the world. Mm. And I think, as you mentioned, for the benefit of the artists and so on. Uh, so, and I think, you know, uh, something that also uh, I love about the project that uh, both of you have worked on, and maybe we can touch on that a little bit. Uh, it's called the Year of the Axe, right? Which is this uh, huge, uh, kind of like wall, um, you know, type of mural but it has also augmented reality and i would love to hear because uh, right before we started recording uh gordon you know you mentioned you know the first idea of the project and how ines kept saying hey now let's also do this let's also do that so uh tell me first yeah. a little bit gordon what was the the first idea and then ines maybe tell me a little bit of you know what are some of the the, the things that you thought about who would make it you know even an expanded project so uh, so I, I, I've eaten at uh, uh, A Wong uh, restaurant uh, before he got his first uh, Michelin star. Mm -hmm. And um, we have a mutual friend uh, who was talking to him about, oh, you should show some of Gordon's work, you know, in your restaurant. And then he kind of, and then he did sort of call up and uh, or message me. I can't remember if it was on Instagram or WhatsApp. And said, "Hey, would you be interested in doing something?" And I was like, "Yeah, for sure." You know, and <laughs> I got talk, got talking. You know, and like, and and, um, and 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 he showed me some images of his conservatory. And I thought, well, "There's no walls to really hang anything on." So I was really only thinking I'd be showing maybe a couple of prints or something like that in the restaurant, uh -huh. and that would have been great. You know, <laughs> and then I told Inez about it, and. Um, and, and she'd been to the restaurant as well. And suddenly he's like, oh, you could do this, you could do that, you know, and just like, you know, and why don't you, why don't you surround, uh, well, actually, I'll let Inez uh, uh, explain, because she, she, she basically in, within, within what must have been about 12 hours, uh, uh, built a, uh, a presentation of some of the ideas that we were like, you know, bubbling away with and uh, that we were to present to Andrew uh, the, that following evening. So tell us, Ines, what were some of those ideas? <laughs> I've always been fascinated in vinyl wraps. <laughs> okay, okay. You know, like wrapped buses, wrapped anything, and a Porsche, whatever, you know, any <laughs> any kind of car wrap. So I saw the conservatory. It was brand new. It was shiny. It was boring. And uh -huh. I said, why don't we wrap it? <laughs> Because okay. I, I mean, I mean, the first thing you think when you think public artwork or, or like an oh, I thought public artwork. I don't know where your print idea came from, but I, I thought public artwork because London is shut down right now. Right. Restaurants can't open, you know, so it has to be public. So I said and then I immediately went to mural and then I said, oh, Gordon doesn't do murals. 
Mm. But it was something that I've always wanted to do. But now, now it was like suddenly it was possible because uh, it had the organizational abilities of Inez here, and right. and also the helping with the you know the, with the positive messaging of the vision, and um, so it, it felt it felt doable. Yeah. So yeah. I said, why don't we wrap it? And then with Gordon, as if you know Gordon's work, it it, ha it can't just be simple. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so he goes, oh, we got to add something to it. Why do, what about augmented reality? <laughs> I know these friends in Hong Kong, meta objects. Yeah. Uh, we'll call them. We'll see what happens. So anyway. And so, and so this project grew uh, much more from just hanging two prints. And it was really also this this uh, synergistic sort of moment as well, because there was all this Asian hate uh, occurring at this point. So the previous most powerful, you know, uh, president uh, of the most powerful nation in the world that was blaming, you know, the virus and literally calling it China virus, right. you know, perpetuating this hate speech, you know, and we are now facing the consequences and the results, you know, of that because people are standing up, you know, uh, in the Asian community against it, you know, and highlighting it and saying, hey, this is not right, you know, and uh, although, of course, it had been happening for years, but now, you know, with a new administration, this has become more public. Exactly. And uh, exactly. so rather than sort of, you know, uh, really making something that was really, uh, overly negative as well. Really wanted to, you know, Andrew, myself, and Inez, you know, and every, everybody pretty much that was on board wanted to really send out a positive message from, you know, from the point of view of a, of um, you know, an Asian artist and an Asian chef, you know, and uh, we wanted to give something back to the community, you know, with a positive uh, message, because the what happens with the augmented reality on the mural is that um, it is about Year of the Arts. Chinese New Year was what it was made for uh, in order to celebrate, you know, our culture. Uh, but also when you put the augmented reality and you, you um, look through the phone on your app uh, in order to see it, uh, you'll see these sort of three-dimensional sort of uh, lion dancers starting to dance around. And of course, a lion dancer is all about warding off evil spirits and wishing goodwill, health and happiness to everyone. So the evil spirits here is the blame, right, you know, right. but also the pandemic, mm. you know, and so the wishing health and prosperity is, of course, the two uh, biggest anxieties that we're currently facing as a society, as a world mm. uh, as well. So it felt like a perfect sort of metaphor to, to try and find that sort of uh, bridge, if you like, between, of understanding you know, that uh, we are not the people to be blamed, you know, for this, but that uh, we wish health and happiness, you know, as as would anybody, you know, that uh, during Chinese New Year is all about celebrating family values. It's about coming together, you know, and uh, uh, being together, you know, to support each other. You know, we give, uh, we give uh, Lei Si these uh, packets of uh, money, you know, to, uh, to loved ones, you know, we're spreading... Uh, you know, uh, lots of uh, goodwill and uh, happiness. And uh, so to at the very least, you know, highlight um, that as a background, you know, to this uh, to this work, but really focus more on the positive messaging, because it's already surrounded by these extraordinary circumstances mm -hmm. and uh, perpetuation of a certain unpleasant narrative that we all can witness right now in terms of what's what those what those consequences are exactly you know thank you for uh, sharing and you know something that i love then you know when you have this concept this idea and then you know as you uh, also bring in the technology part of that and you know people carrying their phones and then using it to see the augmented reality piece and you know i feel like our phones have become almost like an extension of our bodies nowadays right because we carry it everywhere so as you're walking through the street i assume then you you see this uh wall mural uh, art, which normally you'll see something and you know, there's this kind of a sense of a distance between you and the art, but when you see it in your phone and it becomes something else and it is animated and it, it feels like it's now you have immediate access to it, 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 it jumps from 
the object that we see from a distance, the art that you're not supposed to touch to something that now we carry in our hands, right? And I feel that there's also kind of a, uh, an immediacy of that where then your message as you are, um, you know, bringing it out, the importance of that message of inclusiveness and, uh, and the love, uh, you know, then all of a sudden we, we have it in our hands. Yeah. And maybe mm -hmm. tell us a little about, you know, what, what have you seen the, the response of the public or people as they experience uh, this uh, immersive uh, experience? Oh, people love it. They think it's um, fantastic. It's different, you know? I mean, I, I haven't seen, I mean, I have seen actually a lot because I've been doing a lot of research into it, yeah. but, um, but yeah, it's, it's not something very common and you, right. it, it took a lot of explanation in the beginning. How do you mm -hmm. use this? And, mm -hmm. you know, it was a new technology for us as well. So, um, yeah, but very, very positive. I mean, it got picked up by Vogue. I mean, we're also writing on the coats tales of, uh, two Michelin stars, Yeah, but yeah. Um, he, he won his second Michelin star after we we had a meeting with the Remy Martin as a as a sponsor. Uh -huh. Two hours later, he literally got news <laughs> that he won the second Michelin star. That's incredible. And, and we couldn't believe it because we saw it on social media. And went, wait, wait, wait! You, you just won the second Michelin star. We just talked you to know. you. What, yeah. Why didn't you tell us? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. He's, so it's the first restaurant like outside of uh, Asia. China, uh, Asia. of Asia, of yeah. Asia to have uh, to have won uh, two Michelin stars. That so it was just this incredible positive momentum, you know, with right. uh, with the project and everything. And 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 it made it that much more sort of it felt that much more important that we were we were highlighting these sorts of issues while celebrating, you know, the achievements of uh children of immigrants you right. know that have come to uh, a nation that has hosted them and have built you know uh, positive careers contributed to society you know and have achieved you know beyond uh, perhaps even expectations you know it's um, so it, it it was it was a way of like you know trying to um, uh, promote that side of things as opposed to being blamed for something right. that is definitely not any any particular race's fault you know exactly <laughs> no and yeah i totally totally agree and uh you know uh this positive message as, as it spread and i think the timing you know of your project with what was happening is almost seems like it was all perfect or orchestrated to you know to have uh come together at that moment in time and and, and uh you know with the tools that we have also available for us as artists which is wonderful mm -hmm. Uh, thank you for sharing. And by the way, uh, I'm going to invite our friends if they want to check out this project, they can go to your website. Uh, Inessa, would you mind uh, sharing uh, or the website where they can learn more about this project if they want to see how it works? And probably it's also, uh, which uh, that's how, what I saw it also on Instagram, um, on the world yes. of the Instagram page, you have some really cool posts with a hand and then, you know, you can actually see that. Um, yeah, I think the app is the app available. It, it's it, you can access it from Gordon's website. It's gordonchung.com and it's okay. slash uh, Year of the Ox. Yeah, perfect. And, yeah. and there's also a, a section on the website to do a protect your art where uh, we've we created a platform to allow for artists to express you know some of their uh, you know difficulties with the the commercial art world. Let's say. Right. Yeah, and really? um, to, to, so that then there's a there's a sense of like um, a shared experience with what can be very traumatic, uh, you know, um, uh, events. Absolutely. Well, believe it or not, time flies, right? I wish we could be speaking. It feels like we just started, but uh, we have to start kind of wrapping things up. And I would be remiss if I would not touch the subject of NFTs, because I'm sure a lot of artists are when, like, when are you going to talk about NFTs, right? Because you can go into, for example, the Clubhouse app, and every three discussions is somebody talking about NFTs, and uh, we've seen it in the news, we've seen it everywhere. Tell me a little bit about, you know, your, your opinion on the NFT uh, uh, kind of race right now um and uh, where do you see this uh this this going do you want to well nft it? is a non-fungible token right mm -hmm. and um and that's all it is it's it's a smart contract it's a great way to um i guess um keep track of your work like you said throughout it, it's a great way for i mean the art world is going to hate it because it democratizes art but i think it's great for artists i think it's where the future of the art industry will be and um, and and I think people kind of need to lay off um, the bad art that's coming out because 
bad art is just that it's it's an opinion and um and not only that but also in the contemporary art world there is going to be bad art as well so it, it, does that mean that therefore the 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 auction houses the galleries they're all bad or something yeah, it's Damien like a... Hurst's of nfts are bad art i don't think so you know i mean i don't know it's a matter of but, opinion <laughs> but it, i think essentially what it is the nfts is is again yet another form of uh, an amazing uh, certificate of authenticity, you know, it's a, and it's a platform at the same time with a integrated smart contract mm -hmm. uh, in which uh, an artist can earn royalties from resale value, you know, so the fact that right now we've experienced what might have been a manipulated speculative market with uh, what happened to people because the two people that I believe that were bidding for it were actually connected to NFT companies. <laughs> so it could be that they were manufacturing a situation in which they could sort of, you know, permanently create a historical moment to set, you know, NFTs as a, uh, uh, a validated, if you like, uh, uh, market, you know, and, and, and so I think right now it's kind of crashing a bit, but, but again, like with all these social media platforms that we have available to us, you know, we, for example, before NFTs, you know, before before we had social media, we couldn't self publish, not so easily. Exactly. But YouTube and Facebook and uh, Instagram and so on, it allows us to do these things now, you know, and, and NFTs, I believe is another form of like uh, another form of a platform, you know, that is interfaced with the commercial art world. And that's perhaps where the resistance lays with the traditional uh, uh art market and what this might be signaling and the empowerment or the possibility of empowering artists to be able to actually not need you know these uh, gallery systems you know uh and actually uh take um charge of their own uh art market fate mm -hmm. and, and especially because you know uh, as we going through all these you know the currency in which all this happens you know it's a digital currency Right, so you don't you don't even have the banking as an intermediary anymore in all these type of digital transactions. So I say, you know, then it gives uh, um, all who are involved and you know the artists also more control on that, and uh, you know uh, also a way of, as you mentioned, you know, looking at the future of the artwork, even in the digital world. I don't know if, if it's as, as an NFT, you know, the the ability to have recurring uh say you know per se in the percentage of the resale of that asset which right now artists don't have yeah exactly you know, there's has never there, there's none of that anymore once it's gone from your studio and somebody purchases it you're you know out of luck if that becomes a million dollar piece you know in the future but you know for the first time uh have having all that and i think that's i think in every when we look at history in every type of uh industry change you know those who start to feel that they're losing control you know there's always going to be resistance i believe yes yes i mean history history i guess will tell us you know whether this is a, a permanent uh, thing but it it feels like it feels like as though it's such a that it's, it's a useful uh, new type of platform you know for artists to to be able to occupy because there isn't enough galleries to show artists for a start neither so it's just like I remember when I was at St. Martin's, you know, uh, uh, back in the last century, you know, 94 to 98 sort of time that uh, um, when I was looking through the galleries and there wasn't that many uh, uh, compared mm -hmm. to now as well. I looked through it and I was like thinking, oh, my goodness, there's not one single Chinese name in these gallery galleries at the mm -hmm. moment, you know, and then I thought hang on, all of these are really famous artists as well. It's like, so, so when you started to work out, you know, that there's only maybe a few spaces, you know, right. and, and, and then the odds are so stacked against you and you're looking around the year in your art school year and you're thinking, well, there's at least 200 people in my year, I suppose, <laughs> and they're all going to graduate. Uh, and then there's like, how many schools in London? There must be like, let's say 200 in each one of those so you're talking about thousands of art students that are going to graduate and become artists mm -hmm. and there's maybe a handful of like spaces in galleries to represent you mm -hmm. and it's like well you need to take control you know you need to understand what you have to do in order to make an exhibition 
You know, you need to understand what uh, all aspects of what it takes to do that and to engage with the realities of like what it means to occupy, you know, the, the world, you know, right. beyond the art school. Yeah, and, and on the other end, this makes anybody a collector. Absolutely. You don't have to go through a gallery or, or you know, be somebody famous or something to collect or anyone can collect art. Anyway. Yeah, it's a, it's a new form of culture, potentially, that we're witnessing, you know, and I think the new generation understand this, you know, much more easily than, uh, than, than we can. us, <laughs> you know, I guess. I yeah, because, um, you know, to them, the digital space, they're born into it, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, to collect, you know, just digital images uh, is like collecting Pokemon cards or something, you know, but I as a digital form, mm -hmm. you know, or baseball cards. I, I mean, these, these sensibilities already exist. Right. Only right. now with the NFTs, it's easier to transfer from one person to the next, you know, and uh, yeah, and, and so on. So it's it's just a different format, a different culture, and one in which, you know, if you don't engage with, then you guess I guess you'll be le left behind, and that's a choice that one makes. I remember like when my I have a twenty year old now, but I remember like you know some years ago when he started playing video games and and buying like things like armors for his game like you just you're, you're buying what now oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but what are you what are you getting no just like what you know that's when i first started to think about you know the, the digital currency of you're you're buying something that is that you're never going to get anything in the physical world but exists only in that game yeah. system and then uh the 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 uh the whole uh networking and who owns yeah. what and you could resell things and you know uh, but for us who grew, grew up outside of that system, you know, it's hard to to understand because we feel like where's the tangible asset, right, that I can touch and own and put in my pocket when that doesn't exist. It's, it's a mindset shift and, and a different way of, of thinking about the world and mm -hmm. the way we interact with it and the way also we manage assets. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a, it's a similar, I guess it's a kind of abstract, a slightly abstracted sort of idea of like collectibles mm -hmm. and, uh, or the, or this, or this human impulse to collect, you know, things, mm -hmm. you know, and then also the way how it seems to involve sort of social status, you know, that you found a really rare thing or something, you know, and that, and that people then become kind of like, wow, you got this, you know, and I don't know this, it, it, but, but the NFTs, I guess, is there's this feeling that it's just this sort of vapor or something, vaporous sort of thing, intangible sort of thing, as you say. But right. it holds those values, you know, it holds uh, those things, you know, uh, for for those communities that care about it. And there's enough people that care about it that makes it matter, you right. know. And, uh, and also with NFTs, it isn't just a digital format necessarily. You can get like a hard object of something as well, right. you know, there's, some people have sold houses, you know, or yeah. as an NFT, right. you know, and so there's no reason to. And also in the arts, especially avant-garde art, you know, it's like sometimes it was about selling a section of the sky, you know, or <laughs> you know, it's like or stocks or stocks. <laughs> uh, yeah. Another, you know, uh, it, it, a concept. <laughs> what is that? You know, it's like a, a financial or, or financial packages or financial uh, products, you know, it's insurance. It, you know, <laughs> part of the reason yeah. why we had the economic collapse in 2008, though, not that I want to correlate that with NFTs right now, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, was was these uh, sale uh, selling of these uh, financial derivatives, you know, and uh, you don't get anything for that, mm -hmm. you know, you don't get anything tangible for that you know it's um so so this idea of like um uh, nfts because there doesn't appear to be anything in existence other than a, a code you know ultimately is i don't think uh, uh, perhaps a, a, a way of looking at it that will be useful to understand why people are so interested in it you know and and i think fundamentally it's it's a universal sort of um, uh, human condition that it sort of um, has manifested itself into this sort of platform, which is ultimately to do with like collecting things that people care about, you know, and uh, and they care enough to obviously pay, uh, in some instances, exorbitant prices. Absolutely. I think uh, this is a really nice way to wrap it up and to, uh, you know, to, to uh, close today's conversation because we could go and keep talking and, uh, <laughs> and I know you, uh, 
you guys giving us already a lot to think about and a lot of uh, information for our friends here to digest and to start thinking and and um, also following on their own path too. So before we close, I would love if both of you can share what kind of friends uh, find you on social media, where can they connect with you, where they can they see the things that you are doing. And before uh, we close, Ines, if you can also tell us what's coming next. You guys have uh, an important exhibition coming to LA, which I would love to hear a little bit about that too. Uh, so Gordon, where can we find you uh, on social media and where can our friends follow you there? Oh, uh, you can find me on Instagram at, uh, at Gordon Chung and uh, also on Facebook. I have a page there, Gordon Chung Studios. Uh, and then, of course, my website. The website it links to everything, so including okay. my uh, YouTube and Twitter uh, okay. and so on. Uh, and that's where a lot of the updates about uh, the LA show will be uh, taking place. Um, okay. And uh, Ines, uh, where, can, uh, where can we follow you, Ines? Uh, I am at uh, Ines Swen on Instagram, Facebook, and uh, website is also Ines Swen. Uh, ICFAC is .org. Uh, also, you can find us on Instagram at Chinese Diaspora. Mm -hmm. And um, also, of course, everything's on the website, all connected. <laughs> right, um, right. And uh, the next show is actually produced, it's an, it's an ICFAC production, um, and it's going to present Gordon's solo show in um, collaboration with Coats and Scary. And um, and we will also have a very robust programming of um, um, Stop Asian Hate uh, programming that's going to happen throughout um, the duration of the show. And it will be in LA and Hollywood um, mid-July to mid-August. And um, because of COVID, we're gonna we're doing socially distanced kind of like timed things. So please just check our website, Instagram, everywhere for more information. There will be tons and tons of information. Yeah, and, and I mean ICFAC is a is an incredibly important component uh, of this uh, show. You know, the, the aspect to do is stop Asian hate, and ICFAC has actually inspired other groups to form uh, in order to stand in solidarity against uh, Asian hate. So for anybody out there that's interested in, in that type of uh, uh, activism or to at least find people uh, for support uh, against uh, this situation uh, or to help fight against racism in general, I think this is an important organization to be able to go to in order to find that sort of information. We are worldwide, but found in Chicago. That's awesome. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you both for being here. Really appreciate you. Thank you for your time. You've been really fabulous. I want to invite all our friends, you know, to of course follow them both as well, as well as the organization too. Uh, see what they're doing. Uh, check out the LA show, particularly if you are in LA. And now because of social media, I'm sure there'll be a lot of resources online, you know, for that exhibition too. And of course, uh, do us a big favor. If you enjoyed this episode, please click share. If you are listening right now to the podcast, please share it with a friend. Um, you know, just click that, that share button. That would be really awesome. It would make us really happy. Check out our website at www.theartistnextlevel.com where you will find our podcast library, learn about our upcoming webinars, find resources relevant to your career, and much more. Thanks for listening to today's podcast, and we'll see you at the next level. Mm -hmm.